Hey everyone, in this video we are going to, t oh well, I'm going to cover the Type 2 system of, uh, well, uh, the Type 2 CRISPR system. In the previous video, I had said there are at least six known uh, types of CRISPR systems, and the Type 2 system is the one that is most commonly used in biotechnology for genetically engineering uh, organisms. So one of the useful, most useful aspects of the type 2 system for biotechnology is it requires one protein for the interference step. So the CRISPR interference step of a CRISPR viral defense system. So remember there are two steps to viral defense, the CRISPR adaptation step, which adds viral sequences to a CRISPR array, and the CRISPR interference step, which actually uh, targets viral DNA for cleavage. So one pro only one protein is needed for that interference step, and that protein is called Cas9. Remember, Cas stands for CRISPR-associated protein. So Cas9 is the enzyme needed for, uh, you can call it a protein or an enzyme, you can call it an enzyme because it has a nuclease activity, is the, so the enzyme needed for the CRISPR interference step. Now, okay, so what does Cas9 do? How does the interference step work with Cas9? So let's call this the Cas9 protein. Now, even though it's simp the type 2 system is simpler in re respect of only needed one protein for the interference step, it does need two RNA molecules, so two small or short RNA molecules. The first one is not derived from the CRISPR array. It's going to look something like this. Now these are short single-stranded RNA molecules. We can, for all of these RNA molecules in CRISPR, we'll just assume they're, they are about 20, uh, 20 to 40, let's say, bases long. or nucleotides long. Sometimes I say bases, sometimes nucleotides, you know what I mean. So we're gonna call this short RNA molecule that is that Cas9 is interacting with. And you know, I should see this little hairpin structure I'm showing right here, I should put Cas9, show Cas9 binding that. Okay, so Cas9 is binding that. Let me, I'll shave in Cas9 here. Now we're going to call this RNA molecule the trans-activating CRISPR RNA, or tracer RNA for short. Now when Cas9 binds the tracer RNA, we've got this hairpin region that the Cas9 recognizes and interacts with, and then we have this other region down here. Now this other region of the tracer RNA is going to be complementary to a CRISPR RNA that is derived from the CRISPR array. So as you see the next, the previous video, if you, you're wondering what is a CRISPR array. So here's a CRISPR RNA, and let's say here's the repeat sequence from the CRISPR array, and then here is the spacer sequence that is complementary to a viral DNA. So the cursor CRISPR RNA was transcribed, the CRISPR RNA was processed from it. And this repeat part right here binds to this part of the tracer RNA. So they're complementary. So we have interaction between the tracer RNA in Cas9 and interaction between the tracer RNA in the CRISPR RNA, or the, I should say the repeat region of the CRISPR RNA, and then we have the spacer sequence 
which can be used by Cas9 to look for viral DNA uh, in, the, in the bacterial cell. So this is a three component system. Three components involved in the CRISPR interference step. Now, so I'm gonna cheat a little bit here. So I went ahead and diagrammed this before I started recording. So this is a nice diagram I found somewhere on the internet. So I just traced it and, and uh, so I could present it in this YouTube video. So here we have the tracer RNA and I'm assuming these sequences are accurate but we don't need to memorize them, right? But we can count up how long is the tracer RNA? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So maybe it's about 40 nucleotides long. And what about the CRISPR RNA? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So this one's 19, and then we probably have another 20 here or so. So both of these are about 40 nucleotides long. In a previous video, I think I said the CRISPR region or the spacer sequence was about 20 base, 20 nucleotides, and the repeat region was about 20 nucleotides, so we're on track with our estimates. So this is the Cas9 protein, this, this white oval here in the background. This is the tracer RNA. We can see some, some hairpin regions here. Oh, and I could put these, I don't think I put these hydrogen bonds forming um, between the bases of the tr tracer RNA which is allowing it to adopt this secondary structure here. And I think there are probably some here. Let's see, one there, 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 there. And sometimes using, I think, what was it? We saw this in a previous video. I think I got them all. Okay, so we have the tracer RNA here adopting this secondary structure, which is recognized by Cas9. Cas9 binds the tracer RNA. The tracer RNA binds this part, the, the repeat region of the CRISPR RNA. And then here's the spacer region of the CRISPR RNA, the part that is derived from the spacer portion of the CRISPR array. So here, this sequence right here, now this is this is a viral DNA sequence that Cas9 has found and is checking for complementarity to the spacer sequence in the CRISPR RNA. And you can see it matches, it matches. So how does this work exactly, right? So this is a double-stranded DNA molecule. How is, how is, and it should be hydrogen bonding between the two DNA, the hydrogen bond should be found between the two DNA strands of the viral DNA. But we have the hydrogen bonds forming between the CRISPR RNA and the complementary strand of the viral DNA. So this is an active area of research and it's not well understood how this works, but you can imagine essentially what's going on is, is this non-complementary strand is being displaced during the search process while Cas9 is using the CRISPR RNA to look for a complementary sequence. So there's a 10 nucleotide seed sequence, so about 10 nucleotides, about this portion right here. This 10 nucleotides has to be perfectly complementary to the viral DNA in order for Cas9 to cut the viral DNA sequence. So only 10 nucleotides has to be perfectly complementary. So this first half of the CRISPR RNA, say the other 10 or nine, however long we said this was 19. So there can be some mismatches here and Cas9 will still cut, but the, the more identical it is, the more complementar um, complementarity there is, the more likely Cas9 is to cut this sequence. So, and where will it cut? Well, okay, so one more thing. It will only cut, Cas9 will only cut if this sequence is present. Now this sequence right here, these three nucleotides, which are which come immediately after the complementary part of the CRISPR RNA. So we can see this GGG, so matches this CCC right here. 
So match this C with that G. I hope you can see this. This might be too small. You might need to zoom in on the YouTube video. But there's a T, G, G here. So this is called the protospacer adjacent motif. Proto spacer adjacent motif. In protospacer, that's sort of a CRISPR jargony term. We don't really need to worry too much about that, but we just need to know that there has to be the protospacer adjacent motif in the viral DNA in order for Cas9 to cut the viral DNA. Even if, even if the seed sequence is a perfect match, even if the whole CRISPR RNA spacer sequence is perfectly complementary to the viral DNA. If that PAM site, if that TGG is not there, it will not cut. Now, let me re um, rephrase that a little bit. So the PAM site doesn't have to be TGG. It can also be AGG, CGG, or GGG. So the consensus sequence for the PAM site is NGG. And if, say, if this sequence was TAG or, you know, TTG or TTT, this would not be cut. The viral DNA would not be cut, even if, even if the CRISPR RNA was a, was a perfect match for the viral DNA. So where does it cut? Well, this is the PAM site, TGG. So right five prime of the PAM site is where the seed sequence starts. So count up four nucleotides, one, two, three, four. Okay, right between that three and four, that's where it's gonna cut. That's where Cas9 is gonna cut on both sides of the DNA molecule. So it's gonna cleave the DNA across one, two, three, right between this A and G here and this T and C here. Both of those are gonna be cut. Those phosphodiester linkages will be cut and that, that viral DNA molecule will be cleaved. And hopefully that virus won't be able to uh, contribute to the bacteria, the infection of the bacterial cell. Or that viral DNA molecule won't be able to contribute to infection of the bacterial cell. So what else do we want to add there? I hope that wasn't too confusing. I'm gonna have to check this video out and see if you can actually see these bases here. So to review a little bit, we have restriction enzymes that we saw in earlier videos associated with this lecture. And so how do bacteria protect themselves or protect their chromosomes from digestion by restriction enzymes, by restriction endonucleases? So bacteria protect themselves, their DNA, with methylases, right? So the methylases recognize the same, methylases, yes, recognize the same recognition sequences as the restriction enzymes and they methylate them and then the restriction enzymes won't cut those sequences. So bacteria also has to protect itself from CRISPR-based viral defense. And so how do we think it does that? And so why? Why does it need to protect itself? Well, because where are the, if we have a, let's see right here, if we just diagram, just quickly diagram that Cas9 with the spacer sequence there. Now, how do we want to diagram this? It looks nothing like my other diagram, does it? Okay. So just a conceptual diagram here. Tracer RNA. CRISPR RNA. The repeat sequence of the CRISPR RNA. And the spacer sequence of the CRISPR RNA. So we know the spacer sequence matches viral DNA, but where else does it match in the bacterial genome? So it matches the CRISPR array, right? So that's where the CRISPR RNA was derived. It was derived from the CRISPR array. 
So how is the bacterium going to keep its viral defense process, the Cas9 tracer RNA CRISPR RNA complex, from targeting its CRISPR RNA and cleaving it while you know it's looking for a complementary viral DNA sequence? How is it going to prevent that? Well, it turns out there's a pretty clever solution to this. So it has to do with, um, well, let's take a look at the CRISPR array. The easiest way to explain this is let me just diagram a small segment of a CRISPR array. Now, this is the, the region of the genome that has the repeat regions and the spacer sequences. So here's a spacer, repeat spacer, repeat now let's say this is the CRISPR array. No, this is the, sorry, this is the CRISPR RNA right here, spacer sequences in the, in the genome of the bacterium that matches this one right here, spacer sequence CRISPR RNA. This is transcribed, this is a DNA transcribed into the, to the precursor CRISPR RNA. And then this is gonna be processed. So we have a spacer and a repeat right here. So, so how can the bacteria keep this protein complex right here from going back to the chromosome and then finding this spacer, finding it's a match to the CRISPR RNA and cleaving this DNA? So remember the PAM site. So the PAM site has to be present in the viral DNA in order for that viral DNA to be cleaved. So there are no PAM sequences in these repeats here. So if this repeat right here started at the say top strand with the sequence NGG, well then it would be cut. But the repeats are all identical and none of them start with NGG. None of them have a TGG, none of them have a AGG, CGG, or a GGG. It can't start with those because if it did, well then the Cas9 would use the spacer sequence to find the, the complementary spacer in the array and it would cut the array. So there are no PAM sequences that are NGG. So no NGGs at the beginning of these repeats. And that way, the bacteria, bacterium keeps Cas9 from cleaving uh, its chromosome. Okay, so in these videos so far, we've covered uh, two ways bacteria defend themselves from viruses, restriction enzymes, and uh, CRISPR-based defense processes. So in the next video, we are going to take a look at how biotechnologists can use or, or molecular geneticists, researchers can use CRISPR to knock out genes or in um, organisms, different organisms. Uh, okay, see you in the next video.